Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar titled Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. Thank you for joining us online. My name is Kirsten Matthews and I'm the Fellow for Science and Technology Policy at the Baker Institute, the Director of the Science and Technology Policy Program and the Director of the Biomedical Research Program at the Center for Health and Biosciences. Today's event is a collaboration between Baker Institute Center for Health and Biosciences and the Immunization Partnership. Before we start, I'd like to thank our supporter for today's event, including Community Health Choice, who sponsored our recent research at the Baker Institute on vaccine policies and politics in Texas, as well as the Kavli Foundation and the National Science Foundation, who sponsored our webinars over the past year on science policy, science research funding, innovation policies, vaccines, international collaboration, and effective science communication. All these past webinars are available on YouTube from the Baker Institute channel. Um, I would also like to thank the Baker Institute staff, especially the event staff, including Laura Hutzi, as well as Daniel Morali, who manages the science policy program at the Baker Institute for their support organizing today's events, as well as all the events we've done this past year. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my collaborator at the Immunization Partnership, Rekha Lakshmanan, who is moderating today's event with Dr. Hotez. Reka is a contributing expert of, for the Center for Health and Biosciences at the Baker Institute and the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy at the Immunization Partnership, which is based in Houston, Texas. Work involves developing and implementing public policy strategies to improve Texas immunization rates, including working with state legislators to help promote vaccine legislation and to improve increased vaccine access and state immunization rates. She advises organizations and individuals on building grassroots networks, as well as teaches constituents how to communicate and engage with policymakers and lawmakers. Welcome, Rekha. Thank you, Kirsten. It's a pleasure to work with you on this very important topic, as well as with our colleague here today, Dr. Peter Hotez. For those of you who don't know Dr. Hotez, he is an internationally recognized vaccine scientist at Baylor College of Med Medicine and a Baker Institute fellow in disease and poverty. He's the Dean of Baylor's National School of Tropical Medicine, a professor of pediatrics, molecular virology and microbiology. He is also a tireless advocate for vaccines in Texas, across the country and around the world. Today, we are delighted to talk to him about his recent book, Preventing the Next Pandemic, and I've got it right here, uh, which is a very timely topic. But I also recommend to the audience his other works, including Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, where he describes how he got interested in infectious diseases and vaccines, as well as his work fighting against misinformation about vaccines. Preventing the Next Pandemic is a global look at the reemergence of vaccine preventable and neglected diseases and, and the influence social and physical determinants, which includes misinformation, has had on this reemergence. Dr. Hotez also shares his work as a science envoy for the Obama administration, where he traveled across the world talking about vaccines and encouraging countries to develop vaccines and vaccine manufacturing. If you are interested in purchasing Dr. Hotis's book, please see the link to the Brazos Bookstore in the chat box. Attendees who purchase a book today will receive their copy signed by Dr. Hotis himself. And for today's discussion, instead of a presentation, we wanted to give everyone an opportunity to ask Dr. Hotez questions directly. I have prepared a few questions, but we'd also like to hear from you, the audience. Please submit your questions via the question box, and we will do our best to include as many questions as we can. Welcome, Dr. Hotez. Thanks so much for having me, Reka. Yeah, so let's get started. Um, you, you start off your book by sharing your experience um, as a science envoy. And so for the audience, would you mind, you know, kind of sharing exactly what a science envoy is and how you got selected for this honor? Well, we were all sort of figuring it out um, at the time. Uh, this was a new position. What happened was President Obama went to Cairo in 2009 and made his new beginning speech uh, right after he was inaugurated about reaching out to the Muslim world and the arts and sciences to uh, portray a different face of the country. And um, and with that, he cre he tasked the Secretary of State at the time that was Hillary Clinton with creating a science envoy program, kind of a science ambassadors program, kind of high level US scientists to um, be this outward uh, face uh, for the country. And, and the initial round 
included people like Bruce Alberts, uh, uh, who uh, was president of the National Academy of Sciences, and uh, uh, Zachman Awal, the Nobel laureate chemist, and Elias Erhouni, uh, who's Algerian born and was director, past director of the National Institutes of Health. And I think it was very successful. And, and I, I was tapped for more of a, a more specific purpose. And that is, I've been writing and speaking about this concept of vaccine diplomacy, how to build vaccines between nations and build capacity. And I took this on for the Middle East and North African region uh, in 2015, 2016. And it was an extremely interesting time. Uh, both good and bad. It was um, at, at the height of the ISIS occupation in Syria and Iraq and the Syrian conflict and the conflicts in Yemen were just beginning the, the, um, the sort of a war by proxy between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. And then in the, the North African region, that was problematic, especially where I was sent in Morocco and Tunisia, because uh, these were uh, recruiting grounds for ISIS. Uh, so many young unemployed uh, uh, Muslim men were being tapped into um, uh, helping to create the uh, uh, Islamic State in, in Syria and Iraq. So this was uh, also a dangerous time for that reason as well. And there were recent terrorist attacks in Tunisia. So it was both an exhilarating time and a scary time as well because of the terrible security concerns that were happening. And and we did some good things, I think, around building um, building science diplomacy, but also creating infrastructure around vaccine development, particularly in Saudi Arabia, where I wound up making four or five uh, visits. And we still are collaborating with them even, even today. So a question came through, it was like, how did you get selected for this honor? Were you nominated or was there a big giant hat and they just happened to pull your name out of the hat? How did, how did, you, how did you become part of this envoy? You know, I never got a really clear answer on that. I was, um, I've been writing and speaking about this concept of uh, vaccine diplomacy. And uh, I had made it known that, you know, when I heard uh, President Obama give that speech in 2009, the bells and whistles went off and, and uh, I, I knew this was something I wanted to be a part of. I said, yes, this is the, op because this concept of vaccine diplomacy that I'd been writing about before was, was essentially created by Albert Sabin who developed the oral polio vaccine. And not many people know that story that it was really done, not just by Dr. Sabin, but jointly with the Soviets at the height of the Cold War, Sabin had sent his polio strains to the USSR and his counterpart, Dr. Jumakov, worked with Sabin to scale up production and test the vaccine on more than 10 million Soviet school children that was shown to be safe and effective. And it occurred right after the Sputnik launch. And, and I thought, wow, what, what if we could do something like that for the Middle East? And so when, when Obama made that speech, I said, yeah, I've got to be part of this. And, you know, it was pretty clear in my writings that this was, would be a good thing to do. And I was glad it happened. Mm -hmm. And so when you kind of, when you traveled across Saudi Arabia and in, in North Africa, did you see a difference between how you executed that vaccine diplomacy between those two different regions? What similarities did you, did you encounter, but also what were the differences that you had to, to implement because of um, culture, region, obviously kind of the health conditions there as well? Well, you know, the, the, other, the other piece of this was, was also in some ways representing the United States government. So in, in the past, when I traveled to different parts of the world, it was as a, as a professor, uh, as a medical school professor. But now I also had that hat of uh, representing the, the U.S. government. So there was that in mind as well. And, and for me, I think the, um, the added complexity was um, this was happening at a time when uh, President Trump threw his hat in the ring uh, and, and was planning on running. And if you remember, he made some pretty strong inflammatory statements about Muslims. And that also was, was not easy. And I had to navigate that one as well. And um, so there were a lot of needles to thread. And, and I think for me, the most important part was you know, trying to stick to the science as much as possible and pointing out to the to the Saudis and as well as to uh, their counterparts in Morocco and Tunisia, where I was working, 
that this was a vulnerable area because one of the observations that I had made was war and political collapse in Syria and Iraq and in Yemen uh, was causing the return of vaccine preventable diseases like polio and measles. And there was this sharp increase in a parasitic infection known as leishmaniasis that was transmitted by sand fly. So what happened was with the collapse of infrastructure in places like Aleppo, the garbage was piling up, the sand flies were proliferating, and this was leading out to hyper endemic leishmaniasis, which caused a disfiguring illness. And the key was convincing the Saudis why they needed to take this on. One, the drug companies weren't gonna make a, a leishmaniasis vaccine bec- or a, other or other vaccines that were specific to the region because they were regional, not global problems. And so, and then second, I said, you know, not only is it the right thing to do, but it's also in the enlightened self-interest of both Saudi and, and, and Morocco and Tunisia to take this on because um, these vaccines were needed to protect their own populations. And, and eventually I think we, we, we made some progress in that and they launched some infrastructure initially at King Saud University and now at uh, Kaus, the uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology for vaccine development. And we're now act- we continue to be actively uh, involved uh, in, in those uh, important initiatives. So you brought up an important point about, about science. And so I've got a question about scientific collaboration. Um, you know, scientific collaboration between the U.S. and foreign scientists have been a topic uh, receiving much coverage in the media recently for um, you know, obvious reasons, uh, particularly when it relates to nations with which the U.S. is not on the best of terms. Um, can we take a quick step back? And you've shared kind of your concept. You, you, you use the word vaccine diplomacy, but could you please describe exactly what you mean by vaccine diplomacy and all the different components associated with it? Well, there's it's sort of two big buckets. Um, in general, vaccine diplomacy uh, also Im- implicit in that is vaccine equity, you know, share, sharing of uh, vaccines, ensuring that all populations have access to vaccines. And I think the most poignant example of that, what's going on now internationally with COVID-19 and the efforts by the COVAX sharing facility uh, to, to ensure equity and the challenges that we face doing that. But second, I think the other big component is vac- what I sometimes call as a subset of that vaccine science diplomacy, actually building uh, vaccines between nations. And and this was particularly important during the Obama administration, because if you remember, this was a time when the State Department was very heavily focused on the negotiating that treaty with Iran around uh, nuclear weapons. And, um, and the Saudis at that time were not necessarily happy with, the, with, with what they perceived as a U.S. pivot to Iran. And I think a lot of my efforts were in, you know, reminding the Saudis that the U.S. was still committed to a relationship with with the Saudis and that there's these are old and ancient ties that we've had with them. Uh, And 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 as an example, uh, they were sending their U.S. science envoy to Saudi to build continue to build those ties. So I think I like to think that I, you know, was potentially helpful in preserving uh, U.S.-Saudi uh, relations, as well as with Morocco and Tunisia. You know, currently there are increasing calls to decolonize global health. And how does decolonization of global health complement with vaccine diplomacy? And how might there be tension with it as well? Well, I think they go hand in hand because, you know, a a key feature of that so-called decolonization of global health is the the paradigm is not working. The paradigm says that the big multinational pharmaceutical companies, which are primarily based uh, either in uh, Japan or Western Europe or the United States, are going to make these vaccines and eventually they'll filter to low and middle income countries. That's been more or less the paradigm. It's not that the big pharmaceutical companies haven't made a good faith effort to provide vaccines for the world. I mean, I mean, look at the, if we look at the progress of the Gavi Alliance, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations over the last 20 years, we've made tremendous gains. And a lot of that has been with vaccines provided by the big pharma companies. But the point is, 
um, we can't rely exclusively on that. And now we're seeing how this is playing out for COVID-19 vaccines. I mean, of the uh, more than one, 1 billion doses that's been given over, except for China, which has their own indigenous vaccine program, uh, overwhelmingly it's been given in the US, now Canada, the UK, some of the Nordic countries in Western Europe and, and, and Israel, and that's been about it. Um, so when you look at the map of vaccine distribution for COVID-19, Africa is basically a blank slate and Latin America is not too much better as well as the low and middle income countries of Asia. So that that's a problem that we, that we haven't created an infrastructure by which vaccines can also be made on the continent of Africa, for instance. So right now, no vaccines are made in the continent of Africa, which is pretty extraordinary. So more than a billion people living in sub-Saharan Africa are completely dependent on vaccines being imported. Uh, Latin America is a little better because there is some vaccine development capacity in Brazil and to some extent Cuba, but not that much better. So I think one of the messages of vaccine diplomacy is we need to build that capacity. And it's not just a matter of building factories in some ways, or even patent waivers. That's really the least of it. The, the vaccines are very complicated to make and they required people who have been trained for years and years in order to know how to scale up production and do it safely under a quality umbrella of quality control and quality assurance and how to have the uh, uh, national regulatory authority also be able to review um, the quality control and quality assurance mechanisms of that of that entity and that takes time and that, that's and it's taken decades for India to get to that point India is probably one of the largest producers of vaccines but they're an example of what a country can do if they they put their mind to it the problem is there's too few Indias of the world we need something like that on the African continent. We need better capacity in Latin America, in the Middle East, and as well as low and middle income countries of Asia. So that's one of the key messages of vaccine diplomacy is, is building that capacity and putting that infrastructure in place. You know, so for you know countries that you know still don't have that vaccine capacity, you know vaccine capacity building, um, you know we certainly do have that here in in the U.S. And so another question from our audience is, you know, what can we do to encourage the U.S. government to share our vaccine stockpiles with other countries? when we have a very large you know, stockpile of AstraZeneca vaccines, for example, that um, are not currently being used um, here in the U.S. Well, the U.S. has said that they are going to release its 60 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine because one, the U.S. doesn't need it. Um, I think that's an important point. The, the issue is I think they want to ensure the quality of those vaccines and are waiting for an emergency use authorization process. And I don't exactly know what the holdup is. I don't know if it's how much of those vaccines were made by Emergent Biosolution, whether there was concerns about quality or whether it's simply the company um, hasn't provided all of the clinical data. So we don't really know exactly what the holdup is, but I think that will happen. The problem is this, Reka. I mean, let's say we reduce, let's say the US government tomorrow releases 60 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine. And in addition, the Biden administration has said they'll re release 20 million doses of some of their other COVID vaccines, meaning Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, J&J. &J. What does that mean? It, it's really a drop in the bucket. Why do I say that? Because, you know, we've got, we're looking at more than a billion people in sub-Saharan Africa, 650 million people in, in Latin America, where at least half a billion people in the smaller, lower income, low income countries of Asia, that's two and a half, two, two and a half billion people times two doses. We're looking at the need of five to six billion doses of vaccine. So what's 80 million? So what I've called on the Biden administration to do is create a plan. Um, you know, there's no, right now, the U.S. has not shaped a comprehensive foreign policy for COVID vaccines. We're just getting, you know, bits and pieces. You know, we're getting the, the patent waivers which will not have any immediate impact. And, and it's unclear exactly what the long-term impact is gonna be. Um, there's gonna be some donation, but it's, it's all small potatoes really. What we need 
is a comprehensive foreign policy plan that where the U.S. says, first of all, they need to articulate the, the scope of the problem. They need to be able to say, yeah, we've got to figure out a way to get five to six billion doses of vaccine into the arms of people in Africa, South America, Central America, and other parts of Asia and the Middle East. Um, right now, this here's the gap. You know, we, you know, with the uh, with the other new technology vaccines, it's going to be a long time before we do that. So here's our plan to help in the scale up production. So I want to see the U.S. be more proactive in in actually saying how they will support the manufacture of those other vaccines, uh, and and I think that has to be laid out in a in a comprehensive foreign policy speech. I'd love to see Secretary Blinken do that. The Secretary of State, you know, make an hour long speech on vaccine diplomacy and really lay out a comprehensive plan, and which also includes which we can talk about diffusing anti vaccine anti science movements because that's another huge obstacle uh, that we're facing right now, which, which nobody is, is addressing. So I think that's the key, is for the US government to take some leadership um, on this. And then, you know, the question, uh, you know, when I've brought this up before, people say, well, why does it always have to be the US? You know, well, I said, well, you know, this is what the US does. We step up and provide leadership. We did that when it came to World War II. We did it when it came to the Cold War. We did it when it came to things like creating PEPFAR for HIV AIDS. We, if the US government doesn't step up, more often than not, it just doesn't get done. That is the simple reality. And I think we, have, we haven't really done that yet. And I've been critical, you know, it's not fun to, to, to criticize, but and I'm, it's not that I'm trying to criticize, but I think the Biden administration doesn't seem to have that situational awareness that it's their responsibility to take this on. So I think kind of what I'm hearing is that, um, you know, we need a Marshall plan like was implemented decades ago for, for this very issue. Is that a, is that a fair statement to say? Yeah. Marshall plan is not a bad metaphor. And there's two parts to that. There's, there's what we, the Marshall plan from now to the end of the year by which we get doses made. And then there's a long-term plan for building that capacity globally. And, you know, just from your, your global experience, do you think that the lessons learned working with developing nations can be applied to vaccine diplomacy within the U.S.? Yeah, well, it's, a, that, it, it's, it's actually an excellent question because, uh, and I've been writing and speaking about that as well, we do have uh, two COVID nations right now. Um, when you look at the all the vaccination trackers, let's say, for example, the New York Times vaccination tracker, we're doing a really good job in New England, the New England states, New York, New Jersey, a couple of others, California, New Mexico, and vaccinating the population. We're getting to that 70% number threshold that the president uh, mentioned. But when you look at our part of the country, Reka, the Southern, the, the American South, we're doing terribly. The numbers are about half that. So um, and with no obvious pickup uh, uh, in, in the foreseeable future. So I worry that vaccination rates are going to continue to lag in the South, as well as, um, you know, some other conservative parts of the country like Idaho and Wyoming. What's the plan? You know, what are we doing to reach across the aisle and get conservative groups to are willing to adopt that? Because what, what's emerging now, um, despite best intentioned efforts is a blue state, red state split. So the top 10 states for vaccination are all blue or bluer states, the Northeast in California, New Mexico, the bottom 10 are all deep red states, uh, Alabama and, and Tennessee and uh, Louisiana, and, and then uh, Idaho and uh, Wyoming and a couple of other Southern states. So that's going to be a problem. And then if that a lot, if that situation doesn't correct soon, I worry that we could see another surge of COVID-19. Remember this time last year uh, was the nadir in our epidemic. Um, and then as we headed into July and August, we saw that steep acceleration uh, across the Southern states and, and, and into Texas. And it was really devastating. Now we've got 
some of the country, some of those regions partially vaccinated, and we have some individuals who've been infected and recovered and maybe partially immune. So it may not be as bad, but that's the worry that we could still see another big uh, spike. And and remember, it's all B117 variant. That's what that's the one we've got across the country. And now uh, Jim Musser and his team at Houston Methodist have just put out um, some of the new analysis of variants and what's happening with the B117 variant here in Houston. It's acquired a second mutation in the 484 position that makes it um, resemble more the vaccine resistant variants uh, from South Africa and Brazil. So I'm worried this is going to accelerate in the southern part of the United States. So we've got to figure out, you're exactly right, a vaccine diplomacy plan for the South. And uh, and I'm happy to try to, being from Texas, I'm happy to take this on. And, and I don't know what the Biden administration, quite honestly, is doing about it. Um, publicly, I'm not, I'm hearing privately they're, they're, they're concerned and they're addressing it. But publicly, I've not seen any real overture or outreach to conservative groups, um, certainly in the South, certainly here in Texas. And I think that's got to happen uh, if we're going to get the country fully vaccinated. Do you think it's um, do you think it's a messaging issue? I mean, if you were to draw if you were to draw up the plan, what do you think that plan would look like to close that gap? Well, I think recognizing where the vaccine resistance uh, is coming from, and and I've written about this in an essay in, in Nature a couple of weeks ago. There's the the anti-vaccine movement is now a globalized enterprise, and and it's a what I call a triple-headed monster. It's uh, got three moving parts to it. One are the homegrown anti-vaccine groups which started as kind of grassroots organizations, but now have exploded into um, well-organized, well-funded entities that according to the Center for Countering Digital Hate now have 58 million followers on social media. And, and Reka, both of us you know, have been heavily targeted by those groups uh, over the years and it's gotten, it's gotten much worse. Um, uh, as they've gotten more powerful, so that's one bucket. Uh, the uh, the uh, or one the first the first head of the three headed monster. I think the second is you know here in Texas uh, we there was a political shift to the anti vaccine movement a few years back, 2014 2015 under this banner of health freedom medical freedom. This is when Texans for Vaccine Choice were created out of the Republican Tea Party. But it's no long, it's now it's cuts, cuts across the GOP and you can see this play out on Fox News at night. And I think that has a lot to do with it. And you can look at some of the, um, some of the impressive numbers coming out of groups charting this and, and the, the correlation uh, with, with conservatism is pretty strong. And, and that, hard, that part's hard to talk about because in our training, our training is not to talk about Republicans and Democrats. It's not polite and, and it takes us into areas that we're not used to speaking about, but, but it, there's no question that that's a big component now. And so how to, how to you know, take the anti-science out of conservative groups, I think is gonna be a huge challenge. And then because that's not complicated enough, you've got the third bucket, which is a state actor, the Russian government and led under Putin, that now multiple reports from US and British intelligence show how Putin has, created this whole system of weaponized health communication to divide democracies and, and filling our internet with uh, anti-vaccine messages. So this has become formidable um, uh, of those, those three components and, and how we deal with it is, is not really clear to me. And what I've said in the Nature article is, I, you know, the, it's not just a matter of fine tuning or shaping our health messaging. Yes, that's important. But we need to bring in experts who understand how to deal with things like state actors doing what they're doing and, and committed groups creating a lot of devastation and, and to talk to people with expertise in, in, in doing things like addressing cyber attacks or global terrorism or, or, um, or nuclear proliferation because the anti-science empires reached that level. I mean, let's face it, 600,000 Americans didn't lose their lives from COVID-19 alone. It was COVID-19 enabled by defiance, defiance around vaccines and social distancing and contact tracing. And, and to save lives, we need to really look at this. 
So along those lines, um, in in your book, you know, you talk about this, you know, many different determinants, um, which includes climate change and poverty, but you also bring up anti-science, as you just mentioned, and from the previous question from the audience, you know, regarding kind of this growing anti-vaccine movement. But specifically, you also talk about nationalism. Um, and so can you just briefly talk about what you mean by nationalism? Because I think again, to your to your broader point about all these um, different state actors and kind of ideologies that are that are floating around. I think that's a really important point to share with the audience and, and help everyone understand. Well, I mean, look at uh, what you can do is look at um, some of the um, leaders of some of nations that are doing badly with COVID-19. Let's look at the example of Brazil, uh, right, where uh, under President Bolsonaro, He's denied the severity of the uh, epidemic um, and has attributed COVID to deaths to other causes and spectacularized hydroxychloroquine and its effects or spectacularized his own uh, ability to fight COVID-19, even though um, the country's doing so badly. And we've seen that pattern now repeat in multiple countries. So this is true of Duterte in the Philippines or Daniel Ortega in, in Nicaragua or um, and now the, the leader of Tan Tanzania has been in denial about COVID-19 under these under these nationalism or populist trends and and the truth this was true of um, of the Trump White House a year ago at this time when you know you had um, people from the West Ring saying that the COVID deaths weren't really due to COVID COVID-19, they were due to other causes, or you had the, the statements that the hospital admissions were due to catch up in elective surgery, and you had that spectacularization of hydroxychloroquine. All those things played out in this very twisted form of nationalism that cost a lot of lives. So another question from the audience, again, kind of springboarding upon that is, um, you know, the New York Times pointed out that vaccination gaps are more educational uh, versus racial. And so what can we do to address the gap between college educated and non-college educated Americans? Yeah, there are educational gaps. Um, and a lot of this, again, is unfortunately political allegiance. People are now tying their, um, their, um, their, their identity and, and commitment and allegiance to political parties and show, and man, it's manifesting by resisting vaccinations, just like it was social distancing and masks. So I think, and it, and the polls indicate that this is happening more commonly among less educated groups and more educated groups. So I think that that's a big component of it. And I think part of it is less educated groups are often more susceptible to the misinformation, disinformation. So even though the defiance is coming out of political leanings, the content of, of the disinformation is coming out of these dedicated anti-vaccine groups that are claiming things like mRNA, will, vaccines will modify our DNA uh, or that will cause infertility. Um, there's no evidence for any of those things. And, and a lot of it is copy pasted out of fake assertions that were made with the HPV vaccine. So education can be a, a buffer or a hedge against it, but, but not always. So you brought up a, a point about masks and we got a question um, about specifically Texas and masks. And so an audience member asks, um, you know, why Texas did not have a major surge after the governor lifted the mask mandate a few, I think it was a few weeks ago, time is morphing, but um, recently when the governor um, lifted that mask mandate. Yeah, and well, you know, if you notice it, when the governor lifted that mask mandate, people were still wearing masks, at least here in Houston and in, in, in the restaurants and in the, uh, a lot of the indoor spaces and in the workplace. So, uh, you know, at, at least in Houston, I'm not certain how much that lifting of the, of the mask mandates were, had a real impact in Houston and maybe some of the other urban areas. Now it may be more true in, in the rural areas but that's absolutely right. We've not seen the, a big surge happening. 
all I will say is when the the governor, um, just you know, if we remember last year at this time, there was a lot of relax relaxation of mm-hmm. of uh, restrictions, and this was before the vaccine was available, and nothing really happened for many many weeks, and then you saw the big surge happen, especially after the July Fourth holiday. So that's one possibility that there is some seasonality to this virus as well. And, and maybe that that's what we might see. So that if we do see a surge as a consequence of this and low vaccination coverage, we may not pick it up until the summer. I hope that doesn't happen, but that's what I'm most worried about. And that's why I'm pushing as hard as I can around uh, getting people vaccinated. And so another question along those lines is, um, an audience member asks, um, is there a way to test how well a vaccine worked for an individual and how much immunity a person has after they've been vaccinated? Well, potentially. So we're getting our arms around what are called correlates of protection. And there's some nice, there's a paper that just came out in Nature Medicine showing that as your virus neutralizing antibodies induced by the vaccine, substantially are greater than the amount of virus neutralizing antibodies you get from COVID-19 infection, the protection starts going up. So once you get over a one-to-one ratio, meaning that the amount of vaccine, amount of virus neutralizing antibodies induced by the vaccine is substantially greater than the, um, uh, starts to increase over what's in convalescent serum, then levels of protection go up. So it's not perfect because you need other things like T cell responses and and we don't know about long lasting immunity, but that roughly seems to be uh, uh, the beginnings of looking at correlates of protection. So it's all about virus neutralizing antibody, um, at least in the beginning. The problem is we don't have um, easy laboratory tests for that. It requires, we do it in our lab, but it requires specialty testing um, uh, for that purpose. And so we still are, are a ways away from that. Okay. So in the meantime, we got to keep, keep trudging the good, the good fight. Um, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and, um, go a little bit deeper into, uh, vaccine hesitancy because, you know, over the years we have, you know, seen, different um, iterations of, of vaccine hesitancy. And then now with you know, COVID vaccination, we're seeing another change in pivot. But the first question is, you know, vaccine hesitancy and anti-science um, have been a subject or part of you know, both this book and your last book. And, and why is that? Why has that been such a big focus for you? Besides well, the obvious reasons. Well, you know, so I've been devoted my life to developing vaccines for neglected tropical diseases. And then we've had a coronavirus vaccine program for the last decade at at our Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development and the National School of Tropical Medicine. And that's always been my major commitment and focus is around vaccines. I think the the going up against anti-vaccine groups uh, really started became more important to me. Well, first of all, I've always had a foot in public engagement and advocacy more around neglected tropical disease vaccines. But when I saw what was happening here in Texas a few years back, I got really alarmed um, because we started to see this steep rise in the number of kids denied access to their vaccinations in the state of Texas. And the my, the first iteration of this was, I, uh, I'm not only a vaccine scientist and pediatrician, but I'm the parent of four adult kids, including Rachel, who has uh, autism and intellectual disabilities. And I thought, well, look, here I am a vaccine scientist. Parents are opting their kids out of getting vaccinated because of these fake assertions that vaccines cause autism. If, and now that I have a daughter with autism, if I don't uh, talk about this, who will? So the first book I wrote on that was called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which is actually my third book, but it was the first talking about the anti-vaccine movements um, to really go into a deep dive showing the evidence that uh, vaccines did not cause autism, whether it was the MMR vaccine, as it was alleged, or thimerosal preservative, or spacing vaccines too close together, or aluminum vaccines, and explaining what autism is and 
how it begins in early fetal brain development and the fact that we did whole exome sequencing um, my wife and I and, and Rachel in order to identify a gene that's similar to the hundred other uh, autism genes that are expressed in early fetal brain development. So that was the important point. And, and then I thought I was kind of done. And because that was the big assertion, the problem was, you know, maybe we made some headway because of that, but then the anti-vaccine lobby kept on changing their stripes in order to stay relevant. So that's when around uh, 2015, 2016, they became, they took, they created political action committees linked to the Republican Tea Party and, and under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom. So it required a version 2.0 and then the globalization of all of this. And so the, the need to put it a, put a second book out that partly that had part of it addressing this reflected the reality that the anti-vaccine movement to stay relevant um, changes. It's so while the the threat of asserting that vaccines cause autism is still there in the anti-vaccine movement, it's still important. Um, there are other factors to it, including this this politicization. Um, the, um, and then, and then the monetizing the internet and doing all the things, and then the, the Russian state actor involvement. So as the anti-vaccine movement expands and globalizes and shifts in their emphasis, uh, I, I'm shifting with it. So in your travels, did you run into anti-vaccine movements abroad? Um, and how would you compare, and how would you compare you know, the U.S. anti-vaccine movement to uh, other anti-vaccine movements um, outside the U.S.? Well, I think the, you know, for a while, it was very difficult to persuade the big global health organizations that this was important because I think they saw it as kind of a uniquely American enterprise, that it was something kind of walled off to the U.S. or, or North America even though I started seeing elements of it globalizing. And, and, and that's really become apparent now with, with COVID-19. So uh, last summer, for instance, using the same health freedom, medical freedom terminology, the, the anti-mask, anti-vaccine rallies uh, were exported to European capitals. So you saw this in London, in Paris, in Berlin. In Berlin, they tried to storm the Reichstag. There was the German parliament. So it really took on this very dark tone. And, and what, was, what I found interesting were reports in the New York Times and the BBC that these were linked to QAnon, so, uh, which really started out of the US. So that political extremism on the far right that was part of the US in, in when, when the political action committees from were now being exported to Europe. So that was worrisome. And then um, we're now seeing that um, coming you know, from a lot of the African nations now uh, that people are using that same kind of language around um, COVID-19 vaccines that were being used in, in the U.S. around fertility and, and other matters. So this has become a full-on anti-science empire. And the analytics group Noveta just recently reported that um, the Putin government is now specifically trying to discredit COVID-19 vaccines in order to prop up Sputnik V. So this is uh, also their, their own uh, uh, vaccine that they've made. So this is now a full-on global enterprise. And, and, and I'm still, I tend to be one, an outlier in terms of this reporting on the depth and breadth and the internationalization of of the anti-vaccine, anti-science move, but slowly people are understanding it and, and catching on, but I'm still slow to want to do anything about it. I mean, in, you know, in 2019, the World Health Organization, you know, declared uh, vaccine hesitancy as one as was one of the you know top 10 global health threats. That was two years ago, and then you know, fast forward, we're in the middle of a of a you know, major, you know, catastrophic infectious disease pandemic. Do you think the WHO has um, a different level of appreciation and kind of understanding in terms of the tentacles of the anti-vaccine movement globally? I think they're starting to, and, and they're certainly talking to me more, talking to other colleagues, like, of course, Heidi Larson, who's a really important uh, thought leader in, in all of this. I think the 
but what to do about it, I think is still stuck in the past. I still, they, they're still, and, and the U S government's the same, the, you know, I've been on zoom calls for the last two years, as I'm sure you have as well. And, and you know how the content of those zoom calls are, it's all about uh, amplifying our message or fine tuning our message around vaccines. And I think that's all well and good. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's sufficient because, you know, amplifying our message, these are still messages and bottles floating in the Atlantic Ocean. We need um, uh, more of a counterpunch or a counteroffensive against what's now a globalized anti vaccine empire. Exactly what the content of that counterpunch or counteroffensive is. I'm the first to say I don't know because it's clear that this goes beyond my, my skill set is training as a physician scientist. All I can say is amplifying our message is it's still being drowned out. And we're going to need to look into whatever levers we can pull and push uh, in, in terms of what our options are. And again, that means, and this is what I wrote in the nature paper, we can't just keep on talking to the same people in the health sector about this. We have to recognize how lethal this movement is and talk to groups that have experience in combating global terrorism or nuclear proliferation or, or cyber cyber attacks and get their input on what, what our options are. And we haven't even really started that dialogue in any meaningful way. The Center for Countering Digital Hate, it's amazing we even have to have an organization named that way, is starting to really look at this in more depth, but we need, we need much more than that. So for the, for the audience member who does not have the far reaches of the World Health Organization um, as, as you do, um, we have an audience member who asked, you know, if, how, how does one, if someone encounters a person who asks, you know, why should I not be allowed to make a decision for my own child? So kind of reverting back to this new argument around parental rights and medical freedom, how would you, or what would you advise that person to say or have that conversation with that person, which is, this is my decision. You know, I'm, I'm the parent and um, I know what's best for my child and nobody else does. Well, you know what, I would try to understand what their concerns are because uh, more often than not, that parent has uh, been downloading quite a bit of misinformation from anti-vaccine groups. And it's not easy and it takes time. I mean, most parents who are, are reluctant or resistant to vaccines are actually not deeply dug in. Um, they, they just need time to, to explain why, there, why the reasons for it is based on, uh, is based on false assumptions and, and misinformation. And you can get parents to vaccinate their kids or get people to accept COVID-19 vaccines. But then there is another set that's really deeply dug in and, you know, on these chat groups on Facebook and believes all the conspiracy theories, that gets really tough. Um, and, you know, what I'll say is, you know, there are times when we uh, don't let parents make choices. Um, we have seatbelt laws, right? As a parent, you're, you're obligated. If you put your child in a car seat or in the back of a car, that child has to be strapped in. That's, that's not a choice. Or if, you own a firearm at home, you have to keep that firearm locked. And um, so there are certain things that the state does to protect children. And I think that's the reason why we have vaccine requirements for, for school. And then, you know, kind of along those lines of, of hesitancy, but also confidence, you know, you're exactly right that, you know, not everyone who has a question about vaccines are anti-vaccine. It's just that they, they genuinely have a question and they need. And, and most, and most are not. Um, it's again, right. that's why I tend to be sympathetic or empathetic is because they themselves are victims to this uh, massive onslaught of, of misinformation and disinformation. Right. And then, you know, just with the volume of information that is being thrown at everyone on various, you know, platforms and, and channels, um, you know, one specific question came up regarding um, COVID vaccination, but the J&J &J vaccine. And so kind of as part of this sort of confidence building, um, 
Someone asks, how can we increase confidence with the J&J vaccine after the reports of, of blood clots? Because again, you know, we're all kind of drinking from a fire hose when it comes to information. And so how do you set aside the misinformation and really try to help build up people's confidence in, in taking COVID vaccine? And in this case, the J&J vaccine. Well, this is what the anti-vaccine lobby does, right? They take, they take points of vulnerability there and blow them open. So in this case, the J&J vaccine uh, does cause a rare serious event, cerebral, a cerebral thrombotic event, and it occurs, you know, roughly in between one and a hundred thousand, one in a million, um, but it's there. And, and the problem is the anti-vaccine groups um, just tend to attribute a lot of other things around it and build this sense of insecurity around uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So continuing to point out that it, it's a rare event. And, you know, fortunately in the US, we do have other options um, because we have the both mRNA vaccines here in abundance. Um, the problem is, is that elsewhere, all that's available are adenovirus vectored vaccines. Some countries, all they have access to are the three adenovirus-based vaccines, Sputnik V, which is adenovirus, the J and J vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, and that's where I worry we can uh, lose ground in terms of vaccine uptake. Is is because in those countries where that's all they have, then you're going to get a lot of uh, 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 concern about these vaccines, and nobody's going to get vaccinated. So, well, we've got just a few minutes left, and so um, the question came through: Is did you and your family uh, take? Uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, and um, what are you planning on doing this summer as far as socially distancing and masking? More importantly, are you planning to travel this summer? So um, I got the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine, fully vaccinated. In fact, I was one of the first, uh, and I was really happy to have that opportunity at Texas Children's Hospital back, back in December. Um, and I even wrote about being one of the first. It's an article called Vaccinating Cassandra, which is sort of a fun article and very grateful for it. And I think Anne got the Moderna vaccine. I think Rachel got the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So we're all, all, my, all of our family members are, are fully vaccinated. And I think by the summer, what that's going to mean is if we can really fully vaccinate the US population and we're gonna do it faster in the Northeast than in the South, then I think we can dramatically slow or even halt virus transmission, bringing it back down to containment mode. And then life looks all very much like it did pre-pandemic, um, but it's, we still have a ways to go, especially here in the South where we're so uh, profoundly underachieving in terms of vaccination. And at that point, I, I won't feel the need to uh, wear masks um, uh, unless I'm under some very unusual situations or if I'm traveling internationally to a country where there's still a lot of uh, COVID transmission. So that's the aspirational goal. I'm already, um, I'm not going to a lot of restaurants, but if, you know, my son who lives in Houston uh, comes by and wants to go to a restaurant, we've gone to Hugo's a couple of times and, and without a mask there. And it's, it's, it feels odd. It doesn't feel quite right, but, um, but I, I do think it's safe at this point if everybody's fully uh, uh, vaccinated. And so if I have the option of dining outdoors, I'll do so. But I think, um, you know, it's going to take time for people to feel comfortable being in the workplace again, especially without masks. And it's going to be a process. Um, and But I'm very optimistic for the country. That's the good news. The bad news is, you know, as the economy starts to take off, we're going to realize that most of the world is not vaccinated. It's going to be hard, hard to do business with Africa and Latin America and the Middle East. And, and I'm worried about our economy plateauing, especially here where we we're so dependent on the oil and gas industry, which is working internationally. And that may be a, a big uncertainty. So kind of in, in closing, um, you know, one, um, thing you mention in the book is you suggest a more robust vaccine advocacy system um, to promote immunizations and vaccines and perhaps science overall. And um, we all know that you are um, exhaustively going, um, you know, on the various news channels and helping to educate 
um, you know, uh, everyone across the U.S. Um, about uh, vaccinations and about COVID and and whatnot. But what would what would a strong, robust vaccine advocacy system look like to you? Well, I, you know, I think first of all, you can't separate it from the United States and, and globally. And I think the key is going to be. Um, uh, I think that it has to go hand in hand with figuring out ways to counter some of the more, uh, some of the real anti-vaccine aggression. So advocacy is great, but if, if it's being drowned out, I think we're going to really have to look at this. And just like at the UN level, the United Nations level, I've asked for that. Same with the Biden administration. I think I'd like him to create a task force to really look at how we can get that pro-vaccine messaging out there. Because remember, it's not only just COVID-19 vaccines. We've had a lot of interruptions of childhood vaccination programs. And, and I'm worried about those resuming to the same high level they were back in uh, pre-pandemic. Got it. Well, and you know, any, any last minute words for, for audience members as it relates to kind of helping and supporting you fight, fight the good fight? I mean, this is really a, a community-wide effort. You know, we all have our part. So any last parting words for, for audience members as we yeah, continue well, to move forward through the summer and the fall? Well, thanks. I'm going to have to jump off because I just got a note. I have to go on Jake Tapper and CNN now. But um just to say thank you for this opportunity. It's an ongoing discussion, and I really appreciate the, the Baker Institute's involvement in this and your involvement, Rekha. It's been a real honor to work with you and, and Kirsten and others. Um, this, this isn't, these issues are not going to evaporate. Um, they just keep morphing, and so we'll just have to continue the dialogue. Wonderful. Well, that is perfect a timing. So you can hop on with, with Jake Taffer. And thank you so much for taking time and uh, having this fantastic conversation with us. Um, we so appreciate it. And, um, you know, thank you for sharing this book with all of us. And we'd like to thank the audience for your attention and questions. And again, I'm going to put the book up. Um, if you're interested in purchasing Dr. Hotez's book, please see the link to Brass's bookstore in the chat box. And attendees who purchase a book today will receive their copy signed by Dr. Hotez. Thank you so much for attending the thank many- Thank Bye, Dr. Hotez. Bye. And just to our audience members, thank you so much for um, attending the many virtual events um, hosted by the Baker Institute. You can find more information on those events on uh, the Baker Institute's website. You can also watch past events uh, through the Baker Institute's uh, YouTube account. Until next time, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy, and thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your Monday.